Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Kraus here once again at the Prager UHQ with another great Facebook Live for you this week featuring our presenter of this week's video, Naomi Riley. She's a New York Post columnist and author of the new book, The New Trail of Tears, and her new video is up on PragerU.com, of course, and you can watch it here on Facebook as well. American Indians are still getting a raw deal, and it has over 600,000 views since its release yesterday. Naomi, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. I found your video incredibly fascinating. I'm from the land of the red people, which I guess is politically incorrect to say, Oklahoma. <laughs> so I grew up with a lot of Native Americans, have Native Americans in my family, have Native American heritage. And uh, I think that this is an issue that a lot of people are kind of aware of, but not really educated about. So I love this video that you brought us for PragerU this week. Thanks for doing that. But most people assume that the government's history of hurting American Indians was back during the time of Andrew Jackson, you know, Trail of Tears, and that we've made things right by giving them reservations and all of these government benefits, billions of dollars of which you talked about in your video this week. But did you find, what did you find in the process, I guess, of writing your book, The New Trail of Tears? Have we really helped them and benefited them in any way? Well, I think you're right that most Americans are really not educated about these issues beyond what we learn in second or third grade about American Indian policies 100 or 150 years ago. Um, in fact, of course, as everybody may recall, the reservations were a way of pushing the Indians out of the way um, so that we could pursue Western expansion. Um, but somehow the reservations now have morphed into a policy that we somehow view as protective of their interests, uh, that these are reservations where white people can't destroy their land. In fact, the reservations are a purely paternalistic policy whereby we restrict the rights of American Indians, particularly their economic rights and their property rights. Um, what a reservation means is that the land is held in trust by the federal government. Um, as I say in the video and in the book, the only other people that we hold things in trust for legally are children and the mentally incompetent. So I think that tells you just about where we are in terms of our views of American Indians today and our policies. Um, but what that means in effect, uh, that we hold this land in trust, it means that American Indians cannot buy it or sell it or use it as capital in order to make investments. Um, they simply don't have the same kind of property rights and economic freedoms that other Americans do. So how big of a problem for American Indians are the names of these sports teams that we always hear about in the news, uh, the Washington Redskins or Chief Wahoo mascot for the Cleveland Indians? So um, as, I, as I talk about a lot in the book, uh, the, the indicators, uh, the social and economic indicators for American Indians are pretty horrendous. Um, they are the most impoverished group in the country. Um, they have uh, a higher rates of, of child abuse, of domestic abuse, mm -hmm. of alcoholism, of suicide, um, of, of violence, even gang violence, than any other racial group in the country. Um, and a lot of this really does stem from uh, the economic economic problems that they have. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of our conversations about Native Americans in this country have really focused on uh, these debates over political correctness, whether they be, um, you know, team names or, or other, uh, you know, people are offended by Columbus Day or, you know, or, or, or Thanksgiving in some cases. Um, but honestly, you know, these are not the issues that are really hurting American Indians in these communities today. I mean, if, if you had a uh, you know, if you had the highest suicide rate of any racial group in the country, you know, you would not be sitting around worrying about what the Washington, you know, D.C. residents call their football team. Mm -hmm. uh, so the federal government, as your video points out, spends billions of dollars and has thousands of employees a year focused on serving or they're supposed to be serving American Indians. Do you think that it's helping make their lives any better? I think it's really making their lives a lot worse. And um, a lot of American Indians will tell you this. I mean, I went to a bunch of reservations for this book and I interviewed a lot of American Indians on the ground and none of them are particularly happy with the way they are treated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, for instance. Um, as I say, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Bureau of Indian Education have 9,000 employees among them. Um, and that's about one employee for every 110 residents on a reservation. And they're really, micromanaged like children in some ways. I mean, the, the, I talked to one American Indian, just to give you an example, I was on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation and I spoke to a man 
who basically wanted to uh, buy a very small piece of land to graze some of his cattle on. Mm -hmm. Um, And he wanted to purchase it from his neighbor, who was another American Indian. And they had spoken and the two of them had agreed on the price for this small parcel of land, again, just a few acres. And then um, a Bureau of Indian Affairs representative came in and said, no, you can't do that because we don't think that that's fair market value for the land. Now, of course, in any other, uh, you know, real world (laughs) situation, fair market value is what people pay for the land. It's Mm -hmm. not some made up number in Washington, D.C. by some bureaucrat. But on Indian reservations, that's what it is. And the the particularly cruel irony of this situation is that this number had been made up because the Bureau of Indian Affairs had recently had the land appraised for a kind of buyback program they were doing. And they specifically told the appraiser to make the appraisal high so as, quote, not to screw over the Indians. Wow. And it screwed over at least two Indians. And that's exactly in this what it does every time. So can you explain, because you, you, the land analogy there, the story that you just shared, can you explain the idea of land trusts and how American Indians really don't have total property rights if they own land on a reservation? Right. So this is, um, there's a you know famous economist named Hernando de Soto, and he, he referred to this as dead capital. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if um, a lot of Americans, obviously, uh, you know, they want to purchase a house. They go to a, a bank and they get a mortgage. And if they for if they don't pay their mortgage payments, the bank can foreclose on the house and the piece of land that they've tried to buy. But if American Indian goes to a bank, they can't get the same deal because the bank could never foreclose on the property because mm-hmm. a bank cannot own reservation land. And this affects people not only in terms of mortgages. And by the way, the housing situation on these reservations is perfectly horrendous. I mean, you have people squeezing, you know, 15 people into a trailer home because they can't afford a mortgage. And you have these vast hundreds of thousands of empty acres and you have a housing shortage like it's Manhattan. Hmm. Um, but but more to the more the one of the bigger problems, though, is that American Indians also can't use that land then in order to start a small business. Um, a lot of Americans, when they want to start a business, they use the collateral from their homes um, in order to to borrow against it in order to start up a business. But American Indians, again, they don't have access to that, even though all the all other Americans do. So do you believe that the reservation system was maybe set up with good intentions? Because <laughs> it seems no, like now that, we're... No, that's the amazing thing. The reservation system was set up with terrible intentions. Mm-hmm. It was set up with the intention of kind of warehousing these people. But somehow we have sort of turned it into this thing where we're suggesting that now it has good intentions, that now we're using it to protect them. But in fact, we're not protecting them. And it goes, by the way, it goes far beyond economics. Not only are we denying them economic rights, but as I talk about in my book, we are denying them a decent education. They have a terrible health care system. And all of this is on the federal government. We have no one to blame but the people in Washington. We are even denying them proper constitutional protections. Mm -hmm. American Indians on reservations are victims of crimes at just astronomical rates. And it is because of overlapping jurisdictions and problems with, you know, tribal courts giving American Indians their proper rights um, that, that the rights of American Indians who are, I should emphasize, full American citizens are not being protected. So is there any way to turn, I guess, the current reservation system or the way the federal government handles the American Indian community around, or do we just need to cut it off completely? Well, the most interesting trip that I took for my book was to Canada, actually, and they have a similar situation up there. They call it the reserve system instead of reservations. Mm -hmm. Um, But a number of the First Nations there have been pushing something through the Canadian Parliament called the First Nations Property Ownership Act, which would basically give tribes underlying title to the land. So they would be like, you know, the city of Boston. So even if American Indians bought and sold the land among themselves, um, the, the land would not, you know, the, the, the ultimate title to it would be held by the tribe, not by the national government. And I think one of the things that's nice about the First Nations Property Ownership Act is that tribes can actually opt into it. So, you know, if you're a tribe that believes, you know, you want 
totally communal property and you want the federal government to be protecting your land and be in charge of it at all costs, you know, so be it. You can stick with what you have. But if you are, you know, someone who is, uh, you know, Native American and you really want your community to be able to experience the kind of economic growth that comes from having property rights, you can opt into this legislation. And it would be great to see something like that here as well. So final question, and on an entirely different topic, I really loved your piece this week in Acculturated about the dangers of helicopter parenting. You specifically <laughs> talked about the scenario at the playground. I have a three and a half year old and I'm six months pregnant with kid number two. And I'm sure you know, like LA is this mecca of helicopter parents. Or, and then the worst ones are the helicopter parents with the nannies too. Anyway, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts as to whether millennials could or should learn some valuable parenting lessons from their grandparents' generation? Well, they absolutely should. Um, you know, what prompted the piece, I think, was uh, Anne Hathaway acknowledged that she had been uh, sliding down a slide with her one-year-old. And, uh, you know, doctors will even tell you that this is dangerous because mm -hmm. if you, you know, a 150-pound person is sitting behind, you know, a one-year-old on a slide, gravity takes over and you get a lot of broken bones like this. Um, so it's, I think, on a very practical level, this shows you what the dangers of helicopter parenting are. But in terms of millennials, I mean, you know, a lot of people are pointing to this kind of behavior as the reason that we're seeing this, you know, snowflake culture on college campuses now, mm -hmm. that these people have been hovered over and babied and overscheduled their whole lives. Um, so, yes, I mean, I really would like, you know, uh, young people who are parenting today to kind of think like, well, you know, what kind of kid would I like? Would I like a kid, you know, who's independent, who is able to go down a slide by themselves, um, you know, who who is able to experience the outdoors, who is able to, you know, find things for themselves and walk to the park by themselves. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, the kind of free range parenting movement is gathering steam because mm -hmm. people are looking at this and thinking, you know, maybe it's not the best thing for my children to be sort of raised in this hot house environment. Well, thank you for that piece. It was really great. And everyone should be sure to watch Naomi's latest PragerU video. It's pinned to the, our Facebook page right here, right PragerU Facebook page. And go to Amazon and get her book, The New Trail of Tears. Naomi, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for this great video for us. Thank you. Have a great day.